my name is uh, Richard Swenson, and I am an academic. So deal with it. I mean, this <laughs> apologize, maybe. Um, I have only met a few of you individually. Actually, I've met zero of you individually, because academics don't mingle, I guess. But uh, it, nevertheless, having not had the privilege of meeting you, I know a great deal about you. And I can say with certitude three truths that I know about you that are absolutely um, clear. The first one is that your body is beyond comprehension. There is no scientist on the face of the earth that will ever understand the human body. No, no physician, I am a physician, I'm a simple country doctor actually. I am a physician and I've studied the body for like 40 years. I will never understand the body. It is far too complex. It is, it is mystical, it is miraculous, it is incomprehensible. What I'm trying to say is you have an awesome body, but I'm not gonna put that in print, even on a PowerPoint. <laughs> Let's break that down a little bit. You have 10 to the 28th atoms in your body. Now this is more than there are stars in the universe. There's 10 to the 23rd stars in the universe. So in one sense, your body is more complicated than the entire universe is. And you are turning over a trillion, trillion atoms every hour. Now, you're not destroying the atoms and creating new atoms, because that's impossible. You've got carbon atom, oxygen, iron. Um, you're just using them. You're renting them. They were here long before you, or they'll be here after you. You're just using them for a while, and then you're jettisoning them. Well, where do they go? Look at your neighbor. Your neighbor's got some. Your neighbor's got lots of them. Everybody in this room has atoms from everybody else in this room if you've been here for the morning. There's a kid in Mongolia that is using a carbon atom that I was using when I was growing up. Not only are atoms weird that way, but um, if you were to take a picture of them and blow it up into real big size, it's all space. An atom is totally all space. There's a little tiny dot in the middle called the nucleus, and that's where the protons and the neutrons are. The rest of it is all space. So you are 99.9999999999% space. And that's not an insult, it just is. <laughs> if, I were to take, if I were to take a syringe and extract the space from every human being on the face of the globe, I could easily fit 7.3 billion people inside a sugar cube. I could fit 50 billion people inside a sugar cube. You think you understand the human body? How about your heart? Your heart beats two and a half billion times in a lifetime. You don't ask your heart to beat. It just does it. This is the definition of faithfulness. It doesn't ask for a raise. It doesn't ask for a vacation. It's not going to go on strike. It, it takes care of nutrition, and it takes care of waste, but it also... Uh, gives us the, the oxygen, and we need the red blood cells for that. Red blood cells have hemoglobin in there, so the red blood cell shows up to the heart, goes up to the lungs, gets full of oxygen, comes back to the heart, is sent to the little toe, it dumps the oxygen, comes back to the heart. It does that in 60 seconds. The red blood cell just keeps running laps on your behalf every 60 seconds for four months, and then the spleen says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Go to the red blood cell cemetery and makes a new one. Your red blood cell, if you put it side by side, they're very tiny. They're microscopic. If you put all the red blood cells in your body side by side, they go around the earth at the equator four times. How about your brain? The human brain weighs about three pounds. The male brain is four ounces heavier than the female brain. Because God knew we needed more to stay even. <laughs> Isaac Asimov said the human brain is the most complex and densely organized matter anywhere in the universe. Now, is he right? We're looking for intelligent life out there. I think we ought to shut it down, honestly. Um, I don't think there's intelligent life out there. But if there were, I think we ought to shut down the search. Aside from that, Calvin and Hobbes. Do you, are you old enough to remember the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon? The only, it, was an awesome, it was an awesome series, and then he burned out. Um, and the only one I remember is the greatest evidence that we have that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that it has never attempted to contact us. <laughs> one guy said, I always thought my brain was the most marvelous organ in my body, and then one day it occurred to me which organ was telling me that.
your nervous tissue has over 100,000 miles of neurons, 167,000 kilometers. Your brain is capable of 10,000 trillion computations per second, which has just now been equaled and exceeded a little bit by the gigantic supercomputers. But certainly, they're not three pounds. How about your DNA? You have 100 trillion cells in your body. Now, I'm going to stop here and say you don't have to remember a single thing I'm saying. Because I'm painting a picture using scientific facts to say that your body is incomprehensible. You have 100 trillion cells in your body, and in each cell there's a nucleus. And in the nucleus, there's your chromosomes, and that's your genetic material. You have 24,000 genes in there, and that's made up of DNA. So you take the DNA out of one nucleus, and you stretch it out, and it's six feet long. Take the DNA from all 100 trillion cells and crumple it together, and you've got a golf ball. Unspool the golf ball, and your DNA is 100 billion miles long. What I'm saying is you are ridiculously awesome, and nobody, and nobody understands this, and your capacities are enormous. So that's point one that I know to be true about you. The second point is your body must function in balance. There's no choice in this matter whatsoever. If you don't, if your body does not function in balance, you will get sick and then you will die. There's a, a Greek word, homeostasis, and it means keeping the same. It is a fierce guardian inside our physiology. It's the balanced policeman inside our physiology that keeps us in the center. You don't want hypo or hyper associated with your organ systems. It's expensive and it's painful. Uh, not only is our body have to, if, you, if homeostasis fails, you will die. Uh, not only do we see this balance principle uh, in our body, but we see it in the entire universe. I'm talking about the entire universe, from the tiniest subatomic particles to the stretch of the entire cosmos. The uh, degree of balance in the universe is frightening, and I, it, is, it is scary. Roger Penrose, an uh, Oxford mathematician, says the precision in the universe is on the order of 10 to the 10th to the 123rd. Now, I have a physics degree, and I won math awards. I have no idea what that number is. <laughs> There's not enough neutrons and protons in the universe to equal that number. Now, having said this, isn't it interesting that we've chosen this period in the history of the world to completely jettison this notion of balance in our social infrastructure? We have zero regard for it. Uh, and I'm saying, okay, well, I mean, you can, get away for, you can get away with it because, as a matter of fact, the principle is not completely inviolable. Like, if you were to train your, if you were to run a marathon, you have to imbalance your body. Your body says, okay, good, I'll deal with it. You go for it. This is really good that you're doing this. So, but then it, the homeostasis will act to, to center yourself again as you're, as you're training for the marathon. If you're a doctor at flu season and you're triple booked, you have to deal with that. And it's hard. If you're an accountant at, at tax time, if you're a clergy at, at, at holy season, or if you're uh, an author that's at deadline, they call them deadline for a reason, because you're dead. Uh, writing a book is like giving birth, to, giving birth to a roll of bailing wire. And, you know, I've done that nine times. And like four or five of the times, I literally thought I was going to die. Literally thought I was going to die. But here I am. And so this is the balance. You can do extreme things. You can go beyond, but then you need to come back. And you can do really extreme things, but then maybe you need to take a sabbatical or something. Uh, th just think about balance with regard to our well-being. The, the next thing is that your body has limits. And it's amazing to me that I get paid money to travel around the country and explain something that has a kindergarten level logic associated with it. Of, of course we have limits. How about time, for example? There is a wall that went up last night at midnight, and there's a wall tonight at midnight. In between there, you have 24 hours, and I don't care how pious you are, you're not getting an extra two seconds. How about money in your wallet? You have a certain amount of money in your wallet. And you say, well, I'm going to work harder next year. Yeah, but you're not going to be able to buy this building or Manhattan Island. And how about physical energy? Uh, well, I'm going to work out to the gym next year. Great, but you're not going to be able to swim the Pacific Ocean or go six months without sleeping. 
you understand, there are limits, there are limits. And sometimes we test those limits and that's fine. Um, how about emotional energy? You say, I have a friend who's wounded right now and, and you know, I need to carry my friend because this is an important time. And I say, go for it. That's what life is for. You're supposed to expend yourself for those kinds of things. That's tremendous. I have a friend that's wounded right now and I'm helping to carry this person. But you can't carry 300 people for three years. And so we have these limits and they're very real. The thing about limits is they're relatively static. You can't double your limits like every year. They're about the same. And by the time you're <laughs> my age, they're shrinking at the exponentially. Uh, now the story gets really interesting because we introduce a new character into our narrative. You know, we've got a protagonist and now we get an antagonist and that happens to be progress. Now, I'm not, I don't want to beat up on progress, but it is an enemy in this story. Progress is a major enemy with regard to the whole issue of balance and limits and margin, the space between our load and our limits. And so we could paint the picture that looks like this. This is not incorrect. There's a boxing match going on, and you know who's winning? Progress is landing all the blows. So let's, let's dissect progress a little bit so we can uh, understand it perhaps uh, a little better. Um, the way progress works, unfortunately, right now, it has been uh, overwhelming of our capacities right and left and right and left. Just in the last 10, 20, 30 years, maybe 40 years, uh, devastating to balance, devastating to margin. This is the main culprit. I've studied this for 33 years. Um, now, again, I don't want to give a black eye to progress because it has been spectacular and glorious, and it continues to be. And you live at the most, one of the most amazing times in the history of the world. And if, if I were given the choice to pick a time to live, I would choose right now. It's, it's, it's amazing. But we have to be wise, and this is part of part of that um, requirement of wisdom. Now, wh what is the definition of progress? Progress is the notion that life automatically improves. That didn't always exist in that kind of way because for the majority of history, life did not automatically improve. But now, how does progress accomplish this? It accomplishes this, and I'm taking a half an hour shortcut here. It accomplishes this by giving us more and more of everything faster and faster. More and more of everything, faster and faster. That's the way progress uh, works. Um, progress 1.0, if you were to go back to um, probably Sumerian people about 5,000 years ago in modern-day Iraq, they were probably the first writing. So from first written history to 1750, there was no progress. Progress was a no-show. People were destitute, and they needed more, and progress didn't care. <laughs> it, didn't, it completely underperformed. Um, the result was nothing. Then you get to 1750 and 1800, and you have the Industrial Revolution, and all of a sudden, it figured it out. Somehow, it figured out how to do this. And it started giving us more and more of everything faster and faster. And at first, uh, people were a little confused by that because they'd never seen this before, um, and, and even a little borderline annoyed. But by 1800, 1810, 1820, there was this faith and this notion of progress on both sides of the Atlantic that life automatically would improve. And that continues on up until today. People love it. But you get into Progress 3.0, and we have an uncontrollable explosion. The math right now has simply exploded. And that's why we have to understand this, and yes, and embrace progress, but be careful about handing over the keys to the kingdom to it, because uh, there are some issues here. Everything functioning in the system is on a collision course. Every system, you are, your human body is a system. Wherever you work is a system. Your family is a system. There's small businesses. There's large. The federal government is a system. Every system functioning in this, with, within this uh, progress versus overload and imbalance is on a collision course because um, our, our limits and system limits are fixed, are relatively fixed, whereas uh, progress is hyperdynamic. As a matter of fact, it is hyper exponential, if you understand what I mean by that. Um, progress 3.0 has a math problem. And when I do my futurism work, I, everything just reduces to mathematical patterns. So let me um, show you what I mean by the math problem. If I were to assign um, a name to this mathematical 
this huge mathematical phenomenon that progress is pr uh, producing, that would be profusion. So profusion comes from progress. There's one chair here on the platform, that's fine. You could fit 10 chairs here. What if you put 20,000 chairs on the platform? It's no longer okay. And that's what progress is doing, even though the platform stays the same size. Um, you look at this graph and you say, well, that's a population graph. That's an economics graph. That could be a population graph. It would look like that. It could be an economics graph. But this is a profusion graph, and this is billions of times bigger than a population graph or an economics graph. Now, I've got some numbers to show you. I call them a profusion numbers or dysfunctional math. Um, Google sent their scientists out to count the number of URLs, the gobbledygook at the top that got you to this resource on the web page. There is over a trillion. Now, I'm afraid we throw the, the word a trillion around so loosely now, it doesn't even affect, people yawn. Well, let me tell you, a trillion is a really big number, okay? Um, every internet device on the face of the globe has to have an internet address associated to it if it wants to participate. And so IPv4 was a, was a system that doled out these internet addresses, and it maxed out at 4 billion internet devices. Well, right now we have somewhere between like 13 and 18 internet million, billion internet devices out there, so we have to come up with more addresses. So they kind of slid through IPv5, and then they landed on IPv6. And this is providing us 10 to the 39th internet addresses. This is 10 thousand trillion more times more than our stars in the universe. So I think we're set for three weeks. <laughs> 40,000 different products in the average grocery store. Is that evil? No, not exactly, but I don't want to stare at 184 kinds of breakfast cereal. 150,000 different products in a Walmart superstore. Now, a Walmart superstore, if you go in there, and I'm talking about here's, super K, here's Special K, there's 10 boxes behind that. We're not talking about the other boxes. We're talking about individual products. Women somehow know how to do this. <laughs> and it's terrifying to men. Oh, I, you know, I, I have a friend who, uh, who went into a Walmart superstore looking for toothpicks, and we, he's never come back. I mean, we've never seen him. <laughs> More video uploaded to YouTube in the last 60 days than all three networks created in 60 years. Thousands of movies per day or per month or per week, whatever, with a satellite or cable or Netflix or computer. Th this is new. This is new. Everything here is new. Uh, 55,000 configurations of coffee at Starbucks. If this was another country, we'd tell you that this coffee may be hot. Good thing this is Canada. Remember the person, for the young people, when the person spilled the coffee on their lap and collected $30 million in lawsuit because it burned them from McDonald's or something like that. Okay, here's some more. Technology will include a million times in this century. Now, some people, the foremost futurist like Ray Kurzweil said this is really a utopia of superabundance. And surely he's right in one sense. But I'm not a technological optimist. I, I you know, I, I say... Three-fourths of those will be designed to infuriate. Um, change will increase a thousand times in this century, and change is related to stress. The average desk worker, according to IBM, starts something new every three minutes. ICD-10 is a diagnostic code. In, the, in medicine, if you come to me and you have poison ivy, I have a code for that. If you come to me and you have a broken arm, I have a code for that. If you have pink eye or an ingrown toenail, there's a code for that, 13,000 codes. Well, we're going from ICD-9 to ICD-10, which gives us 68,000 codes. My doctor quit because of this. The AMA said it will destroy small rural practices across America. There are now 80 codes for a sprained ankle. There's not 80 ways to sprain your ankle. Uh, if I read two healthcare-related articles every day for a year, next year at this time, I'd be 1,000 a a years behind in my reading. Let's drop down to the last two. The average person checks their smartphone 150 times a day. Now, I understand that. I, I'm going to make a confession here. I don't have a smartphone. I'm not saying that you're wrong and I'm right. I'm just saying I don't have a smartphone. Because I, I'm just saying that, okay? <laughs> True confessions. Um, 
and, and I'll stop right there. It's, it, you know, it's so, it would be so handy to have that, but, um, but I don't. Uh, we get nearly three hours less sleep per night than 1850. Um, eight, nine and a half hours per night in 1850, and now it's about six and a half hours per night. Now, how does this affect stress? What does this do with regard to stress? Stress gets a bad rap because stress is not a bad word. It's a good word. As a matter of fact, it's probably a great word. Uh, we use stress in positive ways so often, but there is a negative dimension to that. It's really distress. What is stress? It's the way we adapt to change. So if a mouse comes up to me, I have to adapt to the mouse. You know, if a cheetah comes up to me over here, if my cubs win the World Series, I have to adapt to change, right? Uh, if, if, if somebody comes up to me, and I mean, 107 years um, for the cubs. <laughs> Don't get me started on it. Um, if, 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 you go in, if you move into a new house, and you, you have to adapt to that. If somebody, if somebody gives you a check for $10,000 unexpected, you have to adapt to that. If you find out you're pregnant and you're happy about it, you have to adapt to that. So no matter what the change is, small, large, good or, good or bad, we have the adaptability mechanism. So this is the stressor. This is the stress response. The stress response is a great thing, and you are very adaptable. Very adaptable. Don't sell that short. But there are limits on that, too. And there's a negative side. What if I gave you a stress-free life? You'd die. It's fatal. You don't really want that. How about a low-stress life? We've done that. Pe put people in a low-stress life, high-stress life. Everybody wants the high-stress life. Because boring. So you don't want dead and you don't want boring. That doesn't mean you want hyper-stress. And that's where we're headed. That's where progress pushes us. There's a range of tolerances in the middle here that we function well in. And so the rhythm is you go on one side and you go to the other side, but come back to the middle because this is where you function really best. And this is where you live most of your life and this is where you'll do most of your good work and most of your caring. There's a graph here that looks at stress versus productivity. What is your productivity when your stress is zero? Your productivity is zero. And so there's no change or challenge or no novelty. There's no deadline pressure. Nobody's looking over your shoulder. You don't get anything done. As your stress increases, your productivity starts to soar. You see at the beginning, it starts to soar. And then a little bit further on, it starts to level off, and then you get point A, and point A just means you're not God. It's something really hard for physicians to learn. The difference between God and a physician is God doesn't think he's a doctor. So you push beyond point A, and then you're on the downhill side, and you have fatigue and exhaustion and burnout. And so many people live over there by B and C, and they hate living there. And they don't know there's a graph like this, and they don't know you can go to the other side of the graph and get some healing, have a little margin in your life. What, see, B is about 80% productivity, isn't it? Do I see that? If you brought it across, that would be about 80% productivity. There. Now, draw the line all the way across to the left side. You see, you can have 80% productivity on the left side with sustainability. Or you can have 80% productivity on the right side with associated dysfunction. So it's important. Yes, you're going to be over at B. You're going to be over at C. I spend a fair amount of time over there, but I know I'm there, and I know, no, I know I don't want this zip code to be with me for the rest of my life. Okay, what's the next thing about overload? Stress and overload are two big words here that help us to understand this. Everybody is somewhere in this spectrum all the time. If you're at 80%, 70%, 90%, you have some margin. A little space between your load and your limits. If you're at 100%, you're maximized. If you're at 110, 120, 130%, you're overloaded. Now, we're going to range across that spectrum all the time. I don't have a problem with that. I think it's good to come back. Balance is probably right here in the middle or over here somewhere. It's good to have some margin. We heal there. We think about priorities. We remember our kids' names, you know. We, um, but, but what... what the default choice from progress, it'll push you to 110, 120, 130, 138 percent, 145 percent, and you need to know when to put the brakes on. These are the symptoms that will erupt when you get overloaded. 
I just got two slides left, this one and the next one. Your symptom complex is here. So every time you get overloaded or you have too much stress, certain things will start to happen to you and that's your symptom complex and it's, it's kind of unique to you. The person next to you is not going to have the same symptom complex. I'm not going to go down all of this, I just want you to understand you have a symptom complex of one or two or three or four of these things and that's your body talking to you very clearly to throttle down. Apathy, withdrawal, depression, you know, depression is increasing in Western countries. How about irritability? <laughs> That's one of my two hallmark symptoms. I'm not an irritable person. I don't like irritable people. I move away from them, but I become one. Um, frustration, disorganization, mistakes. CPA, making mistakes, not good. Fatigue, burnout, moral failure, relational problems. You're yelling at your friends. Um, excessive self-medication, abnormal sleeping patterns, eating patterns, eating too much, sleeping too much, or the opposite. How about headaches? That's my second one. My mother got headaches, my grandpa got headaches, I got headaches, migraine headaches. Well, I don't like irritability and I hate migraine headaches. Why in the world would I want to live there? That's my body speaking to me. And I know I just have to throttle down, I have to take a break, I have to take a nap, I have to take some time off, and I just do it. If 7.3 billion people come into my <laughs> bedroom and say, get out of bed, I don't care. I know what I need, and I get it, and then I'm in, in, engaged, and I'm invested, and I'm, and, and, and I'm working again. Um, these are some of the symptoms. Largely my assignment today, and what I attempted to do, because I, I did I already tell you, I once spoke for 30 hours on this topic and not run out of material. This is broadly integrated. I have written over 600 prescriptions. Other people have written thousands of prescriptions. There are so many things you can do. And the smaller the system, the more options that you have. Everybody here, literally, you can do 50 things to help decompress. The question is, will you, will you do them or not? And so let's run through a few of these. Um, uh, tame technology, control technology. Tech is great, and probably almost everybody in this room loves tech. Um, it has accomplished a lot, it has helped us be productive, it is, it is entertaining, it is alluring, but you know what, it is not fulfilling. It is not fulfilling. Tomorrow you have to have your fix again. Tomorrow you have to have, you got, and the new tech, you have to have the new gadgets, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, but the best thing to remember about time-saving technology is it doesn't. It consumes and devours time. A guy from Mali says, you guys have all the clocks, we have all the time. He's exactly right. So be careful. You have to control the technology. It must not control you. How about TV? That is a fourth. There's a, a gal that attended one of my sessions and she wrote afterwards. And I don't remember her and I don't remember saying anything about this. She said, I stopped Facebook and texting and I gained an hour and a half a day. Now, I didn't tell her to do that, but I thought, that's easy. <laughs> wow. The limit television, 34 hours a day, uh, 34 hours a week watching television. Um, on the way home, on the way home tonight, buy a shotgun. And when you get home, shoot your television. You, <laughs> do you know how much time? 34 hours a week. I mean, that's incredible. Or just put it away, you know, for, for a month. How about per periodically disconnects? P record numbers of people are checking into hotels in their own hometown for a day to get away. Or stay home and just every Tuesday night live in 1850 starting at 6 o'clock. You can do that. You're not going to do that, but you can do that. <laughs> the loss of felt choice is not the same as the loss of actual choice. You actually have all kinds of choices. Um, the next area, get adequate sleep, exercise, nutrition. Progress has not been good to us in these areas. It has been good to us in health, but not in these three areas. We are sleep deprived, we are deconditioned, and we are overnourished. And that's part of the pathologies of Prosperity. Learn to say no to non-priorities. Uh, learning to say no, I, we've all heard that. Well, uh, it's now become a mathematical necessity because you have too many things that do in a 24-hour day. The math doesn't work anymore, and all those things are good things, so how are you going to decide? Go to your deathbed and lay there for a day and understand what's important and what's not. I've been in the room where patients have died. I've learned from these patients. 
and then come back and live out your life because you'll understand the things that are important from the things that aren't. Control spending and debt, nourish relationships. We know that intact nurturing social support systems translates into good health. But because what I was talking about in the first half hour, we might be the most individualistic country in the history of the world. We need one another more than we understand that we need one another in these roots and these connectedness and community. The free three, laughter, music, and nature. Everybody in the world uses these. You don't have to pay a penny. We don't know why they work. Laughter. People who laugh readily heal faster. Who laughs more? Me or four-year-olds? My age lasts 15 times a day. Four-year-olds laugh 400 times a day. Who do you want to hang with? I don't even want to hang with me. And I don't want to hang with you either. Rent, rent a four-year-old. <laughs> music is enormously powerful. I, I, music will reduce me to tears. Um, simplicity and contentment. My wife and I have invested so deeply. You would be almost scandalized to see the simplicity and contentment that we have in our lives. We find it very, very, very freeing and refreshing. We've traveled a lot. We've, we've been to poor countries. We've integrated that into our life and our understanding. We come back here, we remember what we saw, and they're precious things to us. And finally, think some deep consecutive thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.